fatigues I use for gardening. And okay, today is uh, April the 7th, 2009, and we are at the uh, Buffalo Erie County Historic Society in Buffalo, New York. And uh, my name is Wayne Clark, and my assistant today is Kathleen Matthews from the Historic Society. Sir, for the record, would you please state your full name and your date and place of birth? Okay, Graham Miller, uh, born Buffalo, New York, March 20, 1934. Okay, and did you attend school in Buffalo? I did. And uh, did you graduate from high school? I graduated from Bennett High School in 1951. All right. And uh, did you go on to college at that I point? I attended Buffalo State College and graduated in 1955. And what was your course of study there? It was uh, elementary education. And uh, when and where did you go into the service? I went into the service in Buffalo in July 1955, having found out that getting a teaching job would be difficult if I had not finished my service obligation. Mm -hmm. I was told by the uh, assistant principal at the uh, Lewiston uh, school in which I was student teaching, uh, what's your status with a draft? And he, I said, uh, 1A. He said, well, you might want to look this up when you get out, mm -hmm. which uh, convinced me I should go to the draft board and tell them uh, you might as well push up my number. So within... Uh, about a month and a half of graduation, I was down at the, uh, behind the old post office, uh, being inducted into the Army. And uh, whereabouts did they send you? Initially to Fort Dix, just for processing in. Mm -hmm. uh, we were then sent as a unit assigned to the 3rd Armored Division to Fort Knox, Kentucky. It, is that where you had your basic? Basic training and advanced training were all in Fort Knox, Kentucky. We remained there for not quite a year before the entire division was uh, sent to West Germany to replace the 4th Armored in a uh, procedure that was then called Operation Gyroscope, where mm -hmm. they were replacing entire divisions rather than individuals in, in the units. What was your training like before you... Did you go overseas with the division? Yes, yes. Okay, and before you went, what was what well, was basic life in your there advance? Was, there was basic training, it was basic infantry training that uh, everyone uh, received in, in the Army. So you learned how to uh, march, you learned how to operate uh, your personal weapon, which was uh, an M1 carbine. Uh, you learned how to defend yourself in case of uh, chemical attacks. Uh, mm -hmm. Occasionally they would uh, try to toss a can of tear gas at you to see if you could get your gas mask on quickly. We did a lot of cleaning. Uh, the barracks were uh, old World War II barracks. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, did a lot of marching. We had parades. Uh, we did exercises. Uh, Fortunately, uh, we were able, once we could get passes, to go into the nearest city, which was uh, Louisville. Mm -hmm. And that made that a little more pleasant because uh, we had uh, family friends who lived there whom I could go and, and visit. Uh, it wasn't fun. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't really enjoy it, but it was one of those things that you had to do. Mm -hmm. And I did make some good friends. Now, once you completed the, the basic part of it, were you sent to any sort of advanced Training? The advanced training uh, took place within the unit. We were assigned to the unit as soon as we got to Fort Knox. So I had mm -hmm. been in the Army maybe two and a half weeks when I was assigned to a, an anti-aircraft unit, the uh, 57th Anti-Aircraft uh, Battalion, which was part of the 3rd Armored. Okay, and what was that training like? We were trained to uh, operate the vehicles. We had uh, what were called M16s, which were twin 40 millimeter anti-aircraft cannon mounted on a light tank chassis. And we had uh, the M16, I'm sorry, was the uh, half track. And these were basically World War II vintage half tracks with four 50 caliber machine guns mounted on them. Mm -hmm. So we learned how to operate those. We took, uh, uh, took them apart, put them together. 
Uh, at one point, we were sent down to Camp Stewart, Georgia to do firing practice because you could not do any aircraft firing at uh, Fort Knox. Mm -hmm. We spent about, I think it was two or three weeks at Camp Stewart uh, firing at the swamps. Okay. So you weren't uh, firing at any kind of towed targets? or We did in uh, Camp Stewart. We fired at, at towed targets. And, uh, uh, they were towed by uh, our cats, radio controlled small planes, looked like a big model plane. Uh, one of the uh, interesting incidents is that one of the members of the battery who was uh, not overly perceptive, shall we say, uh, got convinced that uh, he would get extra pay if he was the pilot of one of these. He didn't realize how small it was. And it took, him, took us a while after having kidded him to let him down gently. Uh, and he basically said, well, I knew all along you were kidding me. Uh, Camp Stewart was not a nice place. Uh -huh. uh, it was basically good for artillery ranges. Mm -hmm. It was mostly swamped. The story was that not long before we were there, some outfit who preceded us had lost a tank in one of the swamps. So we, we were happy to get out of there. Mm -hmm. Any problems with snakes or anything like that? No, it was just sandy and nasty. And, and uh, the one plus was uh, a couple of times we got a weekend pass and got to go into Savannah, Georgia. Mm -hmm. which was an interesting city to visit. But we were all glad to get out of Camp Stewart. Fort Knox was uh, palatial uh, mm -hmm. after Camp Stewart. Well, we lived in tents. Uh, at least at Fort Knox, we lived in, in barracks. Okay. Once you uh, went back to Fort Knox, then the, the division was preparing to be deployed into Germany? The entire division was, was prepared to be employed, yes. So there were about 17,000. Mm -hmm. uh, men who were about to be sent to uh, to Germany. All right, and uh, how did you go across to Germany? We uh, took a train from uh, Fort Knox to the uh, uh, base in uh, Brooklyn, and then we took troop ships from Brooklyn to uh, Bremerhaven. It was about a week and a half crossing and somewhat stormy. Mm -hmm. Did you get seasick? Not quite, but a lot of fellows did, and uh, wound up uh, pulling KP uh, about half the days so we were on the uh, on the ship. How was the food aboard ship? Execrable. <laughs> I remember one day when it was stormy, and they gave us steamed duck, which made a lot of people, you know, those who could who could get it down, didn't always keep it down. The food was not very good. Uh -huh. And there was a sergeant on the ship who was in charge of our compartment who was a rather unpleasant character. Uh, there was a uh, popular song at the time called Ape Call, and uh, that sergeant was given that nickname. <laughs> uh, interesting thing is on the way back from Germany a year later, he was also in our compartment, but he had been reduced in rank to private for some uh, breach of the rules, and we uh -huh. were uh, quite happy to see that that had happened to him. So the division went over and stayed for a year and then went back to the well, States? The division went over to uh, Germany. Uh, it was stationed in and around Frankfurt. Mm -hmm. uh, our particular base was a caserne called Fliegerhorst, which had been a Luftwaffe base. Uh, which was about uh, four or five kilometers outside of Hanau in uh -huh. West Germany. Uh, nice billets. They were, they were uh, uh, masonry buildings, had uh, uh, parquetry wood floors with individual squad rooms, uh, tiled bathrooms. Uh, you know, if you had to be in the barracks, they were nice ones to be in. Mm -hmm. uh, the division remained there. Uh, and I'm not sure how long the division remained there because the Army um, having come up with the idea of gyroscope, then dropped it. I think they discovered it was terribly expensive. Mm -hmm. um, now, did you spend a lot of time in the field, maneuvers? We would go out about once a month. In fact, once we uh, got there, we weren't there maybe two or three weeks before we went on maneuvers, and we went right on the base. And it had been a Luftwaffe base, so there was lots of open area mm -hmm. uh, near where the, the billets were. 
uh, our uh, uh, vehicles, in fact, were uh, were kept in uh, what had been Luftwaffe hangars. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, we also went on maneuvers outside. We went uh, down toward Worms. Uh, we went. Uh, on firing missions to a place in uh, Bavaria called Grafenvier, which I understand mm -hmm. the Army still uses. Yep. And uh, I was there twice. I missed the third one for the reason that I was, uh, I may be getting ahead of myself, but eventually assigned as a guard at the gate of the Caser. So I watched my friends take off for Grafenvier smilingly, and uh, they watched me and were not smiling. Mm -hmm. uh, Grafenvier was, uh, had been a military base, I understand, since the time of Bismarck. And we used it for firing. Uh, first time we went, we stayed in tents. Second time we stayed in billets that were heated by uh, uh, stoves fueled by coal briquettes, which mm -hmm. never got us terribly warm. It was at Grafenbeer that second time that I had the very worst meal in my entire life. Uh, our rations had not come up. The uh, PX was too far away to go to for any of us. And so what our cooks did was took the cans of sea rations that we had, opened them, dumped them all together in a big Dixie, one of those big pots that the mm -hmm. Army uses heated them up and served this mess with a bottle of Worcester sauce on every table. It was edible only because that's all there was. Yeah. And needless to say, we had lots of comments about it, none of which I can repeat here. Uh -huh. How did you uh, get along with the German people? Did you have much interaction with them? I had some. I learned a little German. They did give us German lessons if you wanted to uh, at Fort Knox. And uh, we would go out, and I made friends with a German teacher uh, in the little town of Langendiebach, which was just outside the entrance to the Kasser. And uh, he and I became friends, and I would visit him and help him learn English. Uh, he would help me with German. Uh, he had, interestingly, been a soldier in the Wehrmacht and had been captured and as a POW had been in the United States, where he had a brother and sister who had emigrated. He had not mm -hmm. emigrated. Uh, so we, we got along well. And I found out that if you made an attempt to speak the language, uh, halting as it may have been, people appreciated that. Mm -hmm. So I had no problem getting along with the German people. Mm -hmm. And uh, our recreation area basically was Frankfurt, which was a nice city. So we were able to go in. There were nice restaurants. Mm -hmm. At one point, I was able to go to the opera, and uh, but yeah, no, no problem on, on getting getting along with the people. What was your favorite uh, part about Germany? Like well, I, I always hear people say, "Oh, I love the beer, I love the food." Well, the beer was <laughs> good. Uh, the food was good. The the PX had uh, arrangements with uh, American Express, mm -hmm. or the service club, I should say, to take tours. And so we were able to take tours on, on uh, Sundays. So I was able to go to Heidelberg, was able to go to Bad Homburg, uh, able to take other short tours. I was able to take a three-day pass tour to uh, Paris, mm -hmm. an escorted tour. At one point, I was able to take a tour to Munich. So the, the nice thing about being in Germany is that you could, on occasion, get to see some very interesting places. Mm -hmm. uh, none of us got to Berlin because our first sergeant was too lazy to fill out the paperwork that was needed to uh, go across the Soviet zone to go to Berlin. But that was the best part of it. Uh -huh. uh, once your year was, was over with, I mean, you were only in for two years, yes. right? So it was time to be discharged? Very much time. They gave us all re-up lectures, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, one of the majors in battalion headquarters had us in individually and asked us uh, you know, would we be interested in staying in the Army, and I, by that time I'd been accepted to William and Mary for a master's program, and I told him that, and he said, well, I guess you won't want to stay with us. Uh, the, the best story on that was one of our 
fellows who was a uh, farmer from northern Vermont was called in and, and the major said to a well private, uh, what do you think of the army? And his response was, well, sir, it don't show me much. <laughs> <laughs> he he uh, ended the interview right there. None of the enlisted men in our unit re-enlisted. Mm -hmm. Okay. Once you came back to the States, did you go back to Fort Knox? We went to Fort Dix where we spent a few days processing out. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, I believe it was the day after Memorial Day or two days after Memorial Day we were uh, released back to civilian life. Okay. I, I changed into civilian clothes before I left Fort Dix. Mm -hmm. All right, and then you mentioned that uh, you went back to college for I a went, master's program. Went back to William and Mary and spent the next year there working on a master's program. Uh, did they offer you the GI Bill at all? There was no GI Bill uh, at the time. I entered the army four or five months after the GI Bill had ended, so I did not right. have the GI Bill for education. Uh, later on, there was a re retroactive GI Bill that I used uh, to uh, get the mortgage for my first house, but I didn't have it to go to school. I had, I had saved money, mm -hmm. sent money home to go to school, and I had a fellowship at, at William & Mary. Okay. All right. And uh, did you uh, join any veterans organizations at all? No. Okay. Did you stay in contact with anyone you served with? Briefly, I stayed in contact with a, a fellow who had become a good buddy who lived down in North Carolina, and we corresponded for a number of years, and then that sort of fizzled. Mm -hmm. uh, other than that, uh, I don't recall meeting any of the other people that I had known in the service. I saw a couple of names and saw a couple of obituaries of, of local people who had passed away, but I, I didn't keep in contact. Mm -hmm. How do you think your time in the service changed or affected your life? Well, positively in terms of meeting people that you would never have met. I had never met many people <coughs> from rural areas or from the Midwest or from the South having grown up in Buffalo. Uh, and I met some people from uh, Kansas, Minnesota, uh, Mississippi, Massachusetts. Uh, most of them were pretty decent guys. Mm -hmm. uh, got to see some places I would never have seen. Uh, got to experience things I would never have experienced, needless to say. Mm -hmm. uh, as I once heard somebody say, I wouldn't do it again for a million dollars, but I wouldn't give a million dollars for the experience that I, of what I learned doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, did get some funny stories out of it, which I'll share if you wish. Sure, sure. Say one was the story of the fellow with the Arcan. Uh, another one was a lieutenant that we had, West Point graduate, wore starch pressed fatigues, had uh, been to West Point, had been to Ranger School, had been to Airborne School, uh, looked like a poster boy for the Army. Uh, at one point in Germany, they had an alert. Uh, we had an alert every month, there was an alert. Uh, Sometimes it was simply a matter of lining up and they'd do a roll call and that was, that was it. This time it was the full alert and we were to go and get our vehicles and go to a mustering point. Well, we got down in this old half track to which I was assigned. Uh, just as I said earlier, these were World War II vintage vehicles. Uh, wouldn't start. Uh, about half of our vehicles at one point on a road march broke down. Well, this thing wouldn't start, and somebody had to stay with it, and I volunteered to remain inside the hangar with the vehicle rather than go out on somebody else's half track, which is certainly no sacrifice. Uh, I was sitting there, uh, basically just watching this vehicle, not that anybody was going to steal it. Uh, and along came this lieutenant. And, uh, Private, why isn't this? vehicle out. I said, well, sir, it won't start. Okay. Uh, have you tried? Yes, sir. Uh, well, let me try and, you know, basically be my guest. Mm -hmm. 
And so the lieutenant got into the uh, driver's seat of the half track. I doubt if he'd ever been in the driver's seat of one of these things before. And uh, looked at the dashboard and looked around and said, where's the gear shift? Now, the vehicle had a gear shift. It also had another lever that was used to engage the tracks. Mm -hmm. It had another lever that was used to engage a uh, armor that covered the grill. So I said, that's the gear shift, sir. And then he looked again and he said, where's the starter? So I pointed out the starter button, which he pushed, and announced to me, it won't start. Yes, sir. Well, next to it was parked another half track. He said, well, why don't they start it by pushing it with that one? I said, because, sir, that one doesn't have any brakes. If you got it started, you couldn't stop it. To which he concluded, well, private, you better stay here with the vehicle. <laughs> uh, made me very glad the Russians didn't arrive if this guy was going to be leaving us. Mm -hmm. Any other stories? Well, we had the Battle of the Barrack Stairs one time in Fort Knox. Uh, uh, the, uh, somebody rolled a beer can. We were in the upstairs of the barracks. Somebody rolled a beer can down the stairs. Somebody downstairs responded by throwing up the stairs. And the next thing we knew, stuff was going up and down the stairway uh, for about 20 minutes. And guys were having a great deal of fun just letting loose. Uh, Somebody said, well, we, you know, I'm going to call the first sergeant, we're going to complain, and we told him, no, I don't think you're going to do that. Uh, and then it was all over, and we, we cleaned it up. But we had a little fun, say, sort of a boyish kind of thing, but got mm -hmm. some uh, stress, I suppose, out of our bodies. Okay. All right, anything else? Well, I, I don't think so at this point. We. Uh, Okay. So I, I felt that I had to go in, I had to do my duty. I, I was glad there was no combat. I, uh, as I mentioned to Kathleen that this morning, uh, the closest I got to combat was getting out of a bar before a fight broke out, which was, <laughs> which, which was fine with me. Uh, my father was a World War I veteran, had spent three years in combat in World War I. And, uh, mm -hmm. I was in no uh, hurry to emulate uh, that, uh, that experience. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your interview. You're welcome.